Welcome to Discovering. He was a marketing genius and one of the most prominent entrepreneurs of his time. Webster Marble put the Upper Peninsula on the map as a center for the development, building, sales, and marketing of outdoor products. He held numerous patents, and his list of inventions was even longer. All kinds of outdoor gear that really revolutionized the outdoor products industry in the early years of the 20th century. Stick around for a visit to the new Webster Marble Inventing the Outdoors exhibit in Escanaba. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill Soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. The Webster Marble Inventing the Outdoors exhibit at the Delta County Welcome and Commerce Center in Escanaba is the first ever special exhibit of the Michigan History Center to find a permanent home. It's the first instance of an entire collection of artifacts from the state archives to be placed on permanent loan to another site. And the first time that the Michigan History Center and the Michigan History Foundation invested such extensive time and resources into an exhibit space that was not on a state-owned property. But then this exhibit has been unique from the beginning. And a good part of that uniqueness rests squarely on the shoulders of a group of Delta County folks who would not allow this history, such an important part of their regional heritage, to be packed up, put away, and forgotten. Inventing the Outdoors is an exhibit that started back in 1915 in Lansing. It was a special exhibit at the Michigan Historical Museum about what some people consider might be the greatest youper of all time, Webster Marble. Webster Marble was a timber cruiser, he was an inventor, he was an entrepreneur, he was a miraculous businessman, and one of the greatest marketers that the outdoor products industry has ever seen. Webster Marble put the Upper Peninsula on the map as a center for the development, building, sales, and marketing of outdoor products, from knives and axes to compasses and all kinds of outdoor gear that really revolutionized the outdoor products industry in the early years of the 20th century. So Webster's first and most famous invention was the pocket safety axe. In his time in the woods as a timber cruiser, Webster often had a problem using an axe that was so sharp that it would cut through a sheath or cut through his pack. He also realized that a smaller axe, actually more of a hatchet, would be much more useful around camp in terms of making camp, making a lean-to, and cutting firewood. His invention, which was a simple hatchet with a folding guard, allowed people to use a hatchet and then quickly make it safe, covering the sharp edge. It also allowed you to carry it on your belt like this, which was extremely handy. Webster developed this in the late 1800s. He took his first 200 axes to the New York Sportsman Show in 1895. They were such a hit that he sold out all 200 of them in several hours and took back enough orders to keep his small factory at Gladstone, Michigan running for the entire following year. The compasses that timber cruisers would carry in the late 1800s were often large affairs that couldn't even fit in your pocket. And one of the problems for Webster was they were not waterproof. So they would fog up and were extremely difficult to read in cold and wet conditions. Webster 
invented a better compass. He invented a small, waterproof, luminous compass that could fit in your pocket or could pin on your coat. At this point, all you had to do was look down to get your bearings while you were walking through the woods. The big sign above the Marbles trade show display that was in uh, Chicago at a sportsman's show in 1955 and you see it actually in the 1955 photograph with the head sales manager for marble arms harold mackey that sign was also used in the, the up state fair uh, when marbles had an exhibit in the old exhibition building which is now the ruth butler building this exhibit is a recreation of the original madison square garden photograph this has everything from some of the oldest knives as folding hunting knives and as knives marked marble safety axe to the newer, like the jet survival knife. But he made folding screwdrivers, folding fish knives, folding kitchen knives, and folding saws. The outer's knife in the display case was one of two models they made primarily during the Great Depression, 1930s. They were basically a dollar knife. They kept the factory going, they kept the employees working. The marbles like to uh, brag that they never laid anybody off there during the Depression. The big knife down on the bottom was called the Marbles Trail Maker. It was a very popular knife. It, you could use that as an axe or a knife. It is basically a survival tool for a knife and an axe. A very early marbles knife, when they first started using the marble stamp, which would have been about 1912, what really uh, designates a very early marble knife is the number of spacers used, black, red, white and brass, in addition to a nickel silver finger guard or bolster instead of a later brass bolster. This is the standard marble ideal knife, about a six inch blade, a stag pommel with a half inch set nut, and what was very popular at the time was what was called a tube sheath, where the knife just rests in a tube instead of what we think of as a belt sheath today. Made a number of axes, the long-handled double bit, of course, is just a standard cruiser's axe or for splitting firewood. The camp axe is a standard camp axe for splitting firewood, but on the back of the head is a nail puller. He did that with his, his long-handled axes, his pocket axes. One has what is called a claw on the back of it. That's a nail puller. Another one has a pick on the back of it, the number 2P, and that's for picking up a chunk of firewood, like a pickaxe, a pickaroon. So he tried to incorporate multi-uses into his products that he produced. He wanted everything compact. His folding hunting knife, he needed the long blade, but not the long handle. So he incorporated a folding blade tip guard, which made everything nice and compact. Way ahead of its time. A number of major knife companies, K-Bar, Case, Cataragas, they all copied this, uh, this design later on. This exhibit displays again various marble knives and how they were produced. If you stop and think of Marble's Woodcraft knife, it came in basically two basic combinations of handle material and pommel. The blade was always the same. At one time, I had a collection of 57 different variations of just handle materials for that one knife. And the same can be true for the Ideal and the Expert knives too. They made them in blade lengths from four and a quarter up to 10 inches in the ideal pattern. I've only seen one 10 inch ideal in all the years of collecting marble arms knives. Most of them are four and a half, five inch, four and a quarter maybe. Six inch is fairly common. When you get into the bigger knives, they're very rare. A lot of them went for use in the military and wound up overseas in Germany or Japan and never came home. On few occasions, Marbles made knives as a premium, for instance, the Buster Brown Shoe Company. Each dealer was able to get a Marbles knife. The knives are one of the few blades that are stamped beyond the Marbles name. They are stamped Brown Shoe Company of St. Louis, Missouri, and Buster Brown Shoes. In addition to Buster Brown, L.L. Bean contracted with them to build a knife specifically for them, and that knife is stamped L.L. Bean. They made the official Boy Scout and Girl Scout knife, a number 60 sport knife. They made that for a number of years. 
One of the most famous outdoor hunters and writers was a gentleman named Dahl DeWeese. So Webster had Dahl DeWeese design a knife that he thought would be a, per a perfect ideal knife for him. And he designed this pattern right here called the Dahl DeWeese knife. A number of Webster's inventions, which included his knives, his axes, and the match safe, became military issue. The match safe, for example, during World War I, was issued to soldiers both on the American and the British forces. In the 1950s, Marble Arms was asked to uh, produce a survival knife for the military, and it had to meet certain specifications. They got the lowest bid, the highest quality, but they didn't employ enough people, so they didn't get the full contract. But the knives were very popular. They're still very, very popular today. It's highly sought after. Webster was always thinking and always inventing. He had over 60 patents filed for various kinds of outdoor gear. One day, when he was timber cruising by the Days River, he was out hunting for rabbits late in the day and fell into the river. He climbed out of the river and made his way back to camp to build a fire to dry off, only to find that his matches were wet. He barely survived the night. After that, Webster decided to come up with an invention that could keep matches dry, even underwater. What Webster realized was that a 10 gauge and a 12 gauge shotgun shell would not only hold matches, but would fit very snugly one within the other. That evolved into another invention of his, the waterproof pocket match safe. Like the two shotgun shells, the match safe was two cylinders. In this case, he threaded them so they could be pressed against each other firmly where a rubber gasket could keep the matches safe. The Webster Marble Inventing the Outdoors exhibit resides in the new Delta County Welcome and Commerce Center in Escanaba. This facility itself would not have been possible without the hard work and contributions from people and organizations in the area. One such organization is the John and Melissa Bessie Foundation. The John and Melissa Bessie Foundation, primarily the donations go to organizations in the Upper Peninsula. My parents lived here a good part of their adult life. I have lived here my entire adult life. My wife is, was born and raised in UP. My children were born and raised and educated in UP. So we have quite a connection to the area. And my parents just wanted to give back to, to the area however they could to help future families have a better life, whether it's help, helping out with the hospital or, you know, this, this facility, you know, parks. There's a lot of just donations that are made to, could be the Salvation Army, it could be to um, St. Vincent de Paul, it could be to, to one of the churches, and just, you know, a lot of the donations people may not even know about because they're just sort of done quietly. So they mostly was about, you know, giving back to the area, and um, I, now that my parents have passed on, i have trying to live up to what their original expectations were of the foundation. And um, a couple of years ago, I was approached by the um, by um, uh, Vicki and some other people from the chamber that they wanted to um, put up a new uh, chamber of commerce um, building. And along with that, they wanted to do um, uh, make the building large enough to put in the Marble Arms exhibit and also something to honor the veterans of all the wars uh, that the um, uh, people from the UP have uh, contributed to us. So we got talking and before you know it, we had um, plans for this uh, facility, for the um, Marble Arms exhibit and for the veterans. Um, and it took a lot of work by a lot of people but we finally put it all together and uh, with the contribution from my parents' foundation, which was a million dollars, plus contributions from lots of individuals in the uh, Delta County, Upper Peninsula area, and also from the state of Michigan, they were able to make this project work. Some of their other items, unusual items, was the marble saw set, the gun cleaning kits, which are world famous and still used today compasses, the safety axe in an original box, a wrist compass. Marbles in the 60s tried to get the buyer's base of the female, so they came up with a pink one, and they are very sought after today. He also made 
gun sights, and they still make gun sights today. We have front and a rear sight, a peep sight, or a folding leaf sight, and numerous front sights for virtually every rifle sold in the United States from the early 1900s up to today. Marble gun sights are renowned for their quality. People use them all over the world. They're still making the gun sights today, 128 years later. Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic. He carried with him on his plane a marbles knife compass, but he took a match safe so he could light his cigars. He did this as an advertising gimmick, Webster did. In addition, Teddy Roosevelt was a big outdoorsman and used a lot of marble products. He took them to uh, Africa and into the Amazon. Webster was also a fisherman and he, had, he was also a prolific inventor when it came to fishing gear. He invented a series of automatic gaffs which all you had to do was pry the jaws open and push it onto the fish. Those are for grabbing fish that popped off your hook, for instance, in a trout stream or in a lake. The big long handle, one at the bottom, is called a marble's automatic gaff. And those were used primarily by commercial fishermen who kept it cocked and loaded. They kept them on the gunnels of their boat, and if a whitefish, walleye, or whatever they were fishing happened to pop out of their gill net or their pond net, they could strike it with the automatic gaff and retrieve it. He also invented a series of very special fish knives, folding fish knives which could act as cleaners and scalers, commercial fish knives which could help you clean fish very quickly, and maybe one of my favorites, which is the trout knife. It is the smallest knife that Marble Arms ever made, but one of the most beautiful. This is a very small knife that you would carry in your pocket, and it's used by putting it through your pinky and holding it upside down. And as you can imagine, makes cleaning a brook trout very clean and very simple. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, Michigan was a center for innovative fishing products. In the 1890s, there was a druggist in Dowagiac named James Hedden, who one day was sitting out at the end of his dock whittling when the piece of wood he was whittling fell into the water and a large bass rose up to eat it. And Hedden said to himself, my goodness, if I had a line on one end of that piece of wood and a hook on the other, I could have caught that bass. James Hedden went on in 1902 to found the Hedden Fishing Tackle Company, and he was the inventor of the wooden fishing lure. There was also another fellow downstate. His name was William Shakespeare, Jr. out of Kalamazoo. He had a business developing and building photographic camera shutters for big view cameras, but he also loved to fish. One of his problems was that the fishing reel he used would bunch up the reel. He invented the level wind bait casting reel so that a little lever would go back and forth and evenly distribute the line as you brought it back in. And of course, the Shakespeare Company became a fishing products powerhouse in its own right. Here in Gladstone today, we have the Swedish Pimple Lure Company, the Badenoch Lure Company. The Swedish Pimple, which started out as an ice fishing lure and is now used in a whole variety of fishing, is probably, well, it was named one of the best 100 lures of all time by Field and Stream. Badenoch still turns out lures made by hand the way they did 50 years ago. This large depiction of the marble factory from 1907. The factory itself was just off Superior Avenue, just one block north of Delta Avenue, running east and west. It was a large manufacturing building employing 150 people in 1907. That says a lot about marble arms. Webster Marble indeed made his mark on the world, and along with it, brought the Upper Peninsula to the forefront of the outdoor products industry. His entrepreneurial spirit and hunger for all things outdoors lives on today, in the Upper Peninsula, and indeed, in all of us who live here. <music>